Well, my name is Kenneth Edgers. I'm a guard, and I love working in a museum, especially when we have different exhibits. And that teaches me a lot, and I learn a lot, and I see a lot, and uh, it's helpful. I like the fact that the people that come in here, they want to talk to somebody else about somebody else's opinion. They want to know what you think. I see people come in, I overhear some of their conversations, and they talk deeply about this particular picture or whatever, and I'm like, but that's not what I saw, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's a good thing because everybody that comes in sees something different. There was one particular painting that this guy, he was looking at it from a different side, and I was looking at it from the front. He goes, but look at it from the side and tell me what you think. And I looked at it from the side, and I was like, oh, that's a whole different, you know, it's pretty cool, you know? It was just that one move that made that picture just that much more beautiful. Welcome to Binder. I'm Ray McManus. So, for our episode today, I thought it'd be a great idea to bring producer Drew out of the title producer Drew and bring him in here as Mr. Drew Barron. And of course, in the typical producer fashion, he took over that idea and he has come up with a game. And folks, I have no idea what in the world is about to happen, but I'm excited and equally scared. So this would be fun. Drew, welcome, man, to the podcast that you pretty much put together. <laughs> hey, y'all. Producer Drew here. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it at least once. That's called uh, lead-in, and that's what you do when you want people to know that you've appeared. I'll teach you how to do that one day, Ray. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember when we had that meeting and you were pitching ideas for me about shows that we might be able to do in the future? I vaguely remember that meeting, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the ideas that you pitched to me that I'm now going to edit down for family friendly affairs was strange stuff at the museum. <laughs> well, I got a surprise for you. That's what we're doing today. Awesome. <laughs> That's right. And I don't feel comfortable just talking on a microphone unless there's a script in front of me. So what I did instead was get other people to talk on the microphone for me. So I have brought you a game inspired Ooh. by strange objects at our museum. And so this game is called Creature Feature. Feature, feature, feature. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I asked our curatorial team to come up with some of the odder objects that haven't been out on view in a while that are specifically creatures. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to play you a clip of them describing it to you. And then I'm going to show you a picture of the object. And what I want you to do is to try to guess the context, right? Because okay. a lot of these objects might feel really, really strange without knowing anything about them. But when you learn something about them, it actually makes a lot more sense. Sure. Hopefully you'll enjoy this. We had a lot of fun doing it. And I just want to go ahead and play you the first clip and let you listen to that. Sounds good. My name is Noelle Rice, and I am the curatorial coordinator. Well, first of all, this object is very special to me because back in 1997, this was the first group of objects that I helped accession completely from start to finish as assistant registrar. It's actually two pieces in one. The main part is round. And then the other part is carved to look like tree roots. It is made of ivory, but it's also approximately 220 years old. It's circa 1800. And this was made long before the current ban on ivory harvesting and trade. The subject matter is so unusual because what it is, it's a mouse ball. So it's a group of that animal over and over and over again kind of crawling and writhing on top of each other. So it's kind of like a continual knotted form of compressed energy. And this condensed energy creates a little compact ball of mice. Oh, wow. It literally is a ball of mice. So they're rather cute. I'm going to assume this, is, this must have been a wedding gift, right? Noelle has actually answered this question for us. Oh, so, good. Thank uh, God. So I am going to play you that clip. And the culture from which this object originates sees this animal as an animal or a sign of good fortune and wealth, of abundance, of plenty. Because in that culture, 
It means that one must have enough to eat or to go around. And that's why this animal is there. In American or European cultures, we look at this animal and consider it a symbol of poverty or filth or disease, or we think of the plague. What I take away from that, in this instance, it's kind of like a ball of luck. Yeah, yeah. Which would make sense as a gift. So much of what we deem to be odd or strange or even take that bent a little further to think of it as, as evil or wicked, so much of that is shaped by Western ideology. And now when you think about it in a completely different context, it brings a new light to it. Your point about cultural understanding there is so relevant, especially to like our next creature. So I'm going to play that for you now. This is Mike Dwyer. My name is Mike Dwyer. And I'm the exhibition designer and chief preparator here at the museum. It was a gift from a very generous donor a number of years ago. It stands about 12 inches tall, and it's sort of a fantastical creature that you would never hope to run into in your real life. This creature is sort of crouching on his haunches, and he's got one foreleg planted on the earth and then the other one raised up with the claws outspread. The one on the ground has a snake wrapped around it. He's got wings that are sort of wavy shaped wings emanating from his shoulders and back. He's got these swirls and spirals on his chest, some spots on his arms and stripes that come down like around his abdomen. So he's got some nice decoration on him, but it, some of it has worn away over the years because this guy is around 1300 years old. So we're talking about the Tang Dynasty of China. And I think I'm partly drawn to pieces like this because of the age. I marvel at the fact that it's still with us after that much time, but it's kind of extra cool when you can hold this thing in your hand and you're like, I'm personally responsible for it, making it through the next five minutes. You know, by his description, I was guessing some type of dragon. The scariest thing to me on this is the snake. It's not the actual beast itself. I've got a lot of friends who like snakes. I get in arguments with them all the time. But where I grew up in rural Lexington County, my mom was terrified of snakes. And there was always snakes. And most of them were non-venomous. They were just hognose or black snakes, you know, rat snakes. And so as a kid, you see your mother traumatized by a snake. You know, that kind of affects you. So to me, I don't know what this creature is and what it's supposed to represent, but there's a part of me that really likes it. <laughs> so good news is Mike tells us exactly what this is. He is an earth spirit. He would have been a tomb guardian back in the day. So he was meant to ward off any intruders, the humankind or any, you know, even supernatural intruders. They come in contact with this guy and they'd be like, no, nope, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one more. Okay, cool. And I think you're going to like this one. So we've, we've been looking at mostly ancient pieces, right? Uh, so this is something a little bit more contemporary. So I don't want to say anything else. I just want you to hear it. All right. I'm Daniel Richardson. I'm the preparator and special projects designer. So I know this is part of the Vogel collection, a private collection from two individuals that had, I guess, sort of modest means and still collected art. And when they gave it all away, there was just so much of it. It, were, it was like under their beds and behind the couches and just hundreds and hundreds of objects. So we have a large portion of this collection. And this one object is one of, I believe, six. It's a 3D object, sculptural, say about a foot and a half long. It kind of looks like a sea creature. Like it has some certain features that other animals would have. Like I would say it kind of overall looks like a manatee, but it's got a like swordfish type of mouth and a pig snout. The stomach area is really bright. It's almost like psychedelic colors, very bright yellows and pinks and greens. In the back of it is a deep blue, which is kind of funny because it looks like it's a sea creature. So it would have some type of camouflage if the predator saw it from above. With this bright stomach, I don't know what that says for anything below it. I am trying to picture it like it's a real creature because they obviously, the artist tried to put a lot of lifelike features to it. But some of the features are kind of funny, like 
these fins. It has four fins, okay, or like, I guess how it moves around, but the fins seem to be really small compared to its body size, so I can't think this thing's very effective at moving around or like feeding itself or getting away from those predators I was talking about earlier. This is wild. So these are by Daryl Trivieri, and he actually uses these creatures a lot in his work. He's better known for his 2D work. My question for you is why do you think he makes these? For the same reason any artist makes anything, because he wants to. (laughs) That's a good answer, and it's pretty accurate, because we don't know. (laughs) And actually, Daniel had something to say about that, so I'm going to let you hear from him. I've heard that art brings forward emotions, or you have a reaction to everything. I don't think this piece needs to really incite some reaction. These are fun, and they're wildly interesting, and... Although I was able to create some strange narrative about it swimming around and I'm not sure if the artist wanted me to do that. That's just what I'm going to do anyway. It makes it a little more comical when I picture it trying to survive out there. Just because we don't have the context doesn't mean we can't appreciate it, right? There's a lot to love about this object, whether you know what it's supposed to represent or what creature it's supposed to be mimicking or anything like that. Frankly, art can be fun and that's okay. It doesn't yeah. have to always be this heavy load that you have to carry with you when you walk away from the museum. Don't get me wrong. I think that's really important. And I think art serves a lot of purpose in being able to do that as well. But sometimes it's okay to just make you smile. Sure. Uh, absolutely. I think what happens is that, you know, we're, we're so used to trying to make sense of everything that we expect art to also make sense. We expect poetry to make sense. When it doesn't make sense, whether in the real world, whether in art, whatever, we immediately want to deem it as strange. There's an inherent quality, I think, to allowing art to exist for the sake of art. And rather than us try to impose our own set of ideals and expecting art to do things that it's not capable of doing, which is to make sense to us. Interpretation is really tricky in that regard, Mm -hmm. right? Honestly, it's something I'm terrible at, but I am bringing in someone who really knows how to do it to talk to you now, Glenna Barlow, Curator of Education here at the museum. I'm Glenna Barlow. I'm the Curator of Education here at the CMA. And really what I do is manage all of our pre-K through 12 programs and everything that goes along with that. So that's working with students and teachers and our volunteer docents and everything else that touches that world of kind of formal education. That's a lot of responsibility, Uh, you know, without adding any more weight to what you already do. I mean, you are shaping a lot of how they are interacting and understanding their own personal relationships with the art that's in this museum. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Which is, I think, really, really cool. And of course, our episode, if you will, today is really talking a lot about the beauty of everything strange and weird. What might be your favorite example of something sort of strange or weird here? That's a great question. I always have difficulty with favorites, even with like favorite movie or favorite book. I can't pick. So I never pick just one thing. Um, And to me, when I think about strange objects, what's so great about them is that they really draw you in and they make you wonder. So I kind of think about them in two ways. So I think about objects that are strange or maybe unfamiliar where you have no idea what it is or what it was for, and you're trying to figure it out. And I think that's what makes it great, is that you don't know what it is, but you're intrigued, and you want to know what it was for. So that, I think, is great. But then also there's those, you know, maybe non-utilitarian, more what we think of as art objects, and they're maybe really totally abstract and, and wild, and you're trying to figure out what's happening, or there's just really bizarre stuff in there. I was going through the image files that we have, which I don't get to do as much as I like, One that I had never seen before was the print of a female lion sitting on top of New York City, like a giant lion just with her like paws like wrapped around these skyscrapers. And it was the sky was pink. And it's just objects like that, that you have no idea where that came from. You'll probably never know, even if you tried to research it, I don't think you'd find out anything about it. But I just love that it makes you stop and say, what? (laughs) What's going on? Which I think is a challenge, right, for a lot of folks. You know, a lot of folks who might come into an art museum and they just want to know the facts, purely the facts, you know, who painted it, who created it, when did they do it? And then, of course, they always want to know why. Why did they do this? What are sort of your responses to those questions? Because I know you probably get them. 
people do want to know the why. I think that's human nature. People want to know kind of what it means. And part of that goes to the why. So sometimes it's really obvious, you know, they made it to make money. <laughs> or maybe they, they made it to document something, right? A historical event or a place or a person. And those are kind of the easy objects you're talking about where you can look at it and you recognize it. And you probably have a pretty good idea of why somebody made it. But there's those other objects that are maybe more about personal expression or maybe they're to make a subversive statement or to make a political statement. And that's what gets interesting as we get into art that's not just made for a commission for maybe, you know, one person, but art that's meant to be seen by lots of people. And right. we, when we get in more into the modern era, we see that a little bit more where art is actually intended for a, a museum or a gallery audience. It's not just for one person's devotional use or for a, a king to memorialize himself. It's kind of having that conversation with the viewer. And a lot of times the artist is thinking more about the viewer and that connection that happens. And a lot of artists embrace that unknown part of the equation where they don't know what the other person viewing their artwork is going to think about it. When I talk to people who would not otherwise come to a museum of art, usually it's because they think, you know, art only exists in the realm that you were mentioning earlier about how, you know, it was commissioned or it's really for an elite group of people. I don't know enough about art history to go in and truly appreciate what I'm looking at. And of course, we always hear that about abstract art. What I hear when they say these sorts of things is that they just don't have really a, a very strong relationship with art. It's not that they can appreciate it. They just don't quite know how they can relate enough to it to appreciate it. And one of the things that I think what you do is so cool is you get educators when they're bringing their students to the museum of getting them to think about art well beyond just the facts. Can you talk a little bit about like how you help them to sort of see ways that they can relate to what they're looking at and then to be able to develop perhaps an appreciation from it? I think it's something in human nature that makes us want to know the right answer. Right. And we get so hung up on that. It must be something in our education or somewhere along the way that happens to us. Because one of my favorite things is working actually with preschool or like our preschool groups and really young kids. Because when you ask them, what do you see here? What's happening? They invariably have amazing answers that yes. are <laughs> hilarious or just like ingenious. And it's just, I think, a testament to what happens when you are imaginative and you just allow yourself to imagine what's happening and really not get hung up on the what it means or mm -hmm. what the right answer is. So, yeah, I think a lot of what I'm doing with adults, whether it's teachers or really anybody who walks in the museum, is kind of untraining them to worry about what the right answer is or to know everything about it or what it means. And be okay with not knowing everything about it. And, you know, just understanding that no one knows everything about this painting. Sometimes we don't know anything about a work of art or, or very little. And just being okay with that. We keep the conversation really broad and really open. And me, if I'm facilitating it, I'm just the one who's there to keep things really open-ended and just underscore that, you know, we thought it might be this, but it also could be this. And we always hold those multiple possibilities as potentially viable. And that's important, I think, to model for their own students, because that way they see, oh, OK, I'm not wrong. It's just another possible interpretation. And what better way to do that than with art? Because it's just so inherently open ended. We don't have all the answers. We're all going to bring our own interpretation to it. I can give you a little bit more information about it. But ultimately, all of those interpretations are completely valid. The one space where I do see that kind of, you know, something that's still holding them back is at the very end of a conversation we've had. Someone will be like, OK, but now tell us what it is. Right. <laughs> You're like, no, that's not the point. But, you know, in a way, that means that you've piqued their curiosity. Mm -hmm. They want to know more. And to me, that goes back to what we're talking about with strange objects is that ultimately they pique your curiosity. Mm -hmm. And that's what education is. I mean, it's not about just learning a set of information. Education is, as John Dewey said, the desire to go on learning. So mm -hmm. that's what we're really doing is we're not teaching you a certain set amount of information. We're training you to be curious and to wonder and to want to learn more things always. Thanks to all the museum staff that contributed to that first part of the show. We had some fun, didn't we? Up next, the strangeness continues. There's something very 
strange about the Southern summer. It almost seems like you're on the verge of madness or something because it's relentless. Julia Liz Elliott, after this quick break. Hey y'all, producer Drew here to fill up your social calendar for September with some exciting CMA programming. On September 8th and the 14th, take a tour and get a new perspective on Amanda McCaver's Bright Little Day Stars with volunteer coordinator and installation assistant, Jackie Palmieri. On September 22nd, grab a cocktail and a seat for a panel discussion featuring Carol Suvian, executive producer and director of the Peabody award-winning and Emmy-nominated PBS series, Craft in America. On September 25th, Get your dancing shoes ready for Shea Alexander Presents Live on Boyd Plaza with popular Charlotte-based outfit Reggie Graves and Jazz Theory. You can find out more about these and all of our upcoming programs and events on our website, www.columbiamuseum.org. And now, back to the show. One weird experience I had as a child that I did write about for the, it was like a New York Times, I don't know, those features where they let you tell little stories and they like, they doubted the veracity of it because it was too weird. So I was in this child's play at a Methodist church and then my dad was in some adult segment, like it was a whole night's worth of drama and he was forced to play Judas because he had a beard. And he was like, had stage fright. And so um, he was like studying his lines all the time and kind of deeply getting into Judas's character. And then I was asked to play Mary Magdalene at like age 12. And so I like kind of researched it. And then there was also maybe a story about like her getting possessed or something. And so I took my cues from The Exorcist. (laughs) (laughs) My name is Julia Elliott. I am a fiction writer and I have two books out, a short story collection called The Wilds and a novel called The New and Improved Romy Futch. It's always cool when I get to be in the same room with you because you are uh, not just a cool person to get to talk to and hang out with, but you're probably one of the few writer friends that I have that I just truly admire the work that you do because every time I read your work, there's something in it that either A, freaks me out or B, leaves me wanting to read it again to figure out just how in the hell did that happen? Especially like with your collection of short stories, The Wilds. The collection of short stories really kind of touches on so many different aspects of really, I think, can I say this, shaping almost a new Southern Gothic? Oh, maybe, yeah. I I mean, I think that most of the stories in the collection do take place in the South or even South Carolina. But... There's a lot of genre mixing going on. So like that maybe there will be a science fiction Southern Gothic story or one tinged with magic realism or even like an old fashioned tall tale or something like that. But then there are a few realist stories, too. But even in those, I guess the style is kind of uh, not in the realist mode. And so it links them together, I suppose. I think one of the things that draws me to it is the strangeness of it. But just such a matter of fact voice that provides the story to the reader. Is there a particular place where that kind of comes from with you? Um, Because you were born in in South Carolina. Yeah. Well, my dad, when I was young, always said I had a hyperbolic condition that anytime I related something that had happened, I inflated it and enhanced it. My dad was a weirdo himself who told me stories and lies, all kinds of strange lies. Like he would make up fake diseases that he said we had. One time I got what you would describe as my first authentic adolescent nose zit. Mm. And it was very hard and weird and big. And I was like showing my parents, what is this? It seems too weird to be a normal zit. And my dad said very calmly, I'm afraid you have a congenital hereditary condition called scabrunocatosis. It's where your nose bone keeps growing and growing, and eventually it's going to burst out of your nose and keep growing, and your head will be tangled in a wreath of bone, and you're going to have to wear a neck brace and live in isolation like your great aunt Elizabeth Canty Anderson or something like that, 
who lived by the ocean in a lonely cell, basically. (laughs) And so I knew he was lying, of course, because he was always telling us things like that. But then at the same time, deep in the night, when I'd be fingering the weird zit, I would think, what if it's true? (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Were there other incidents like when growing up, you know, because I mean, this place is weird. Yeah. When you're growing up. I mean, were there other aspects that well, sort I mean, of. I had this theory. So, of course, when I released my first book, people wanted me to write about the Southern Gothic, especially non Southern places, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And so, like, the Huffington Post was like, can you define the new Southern Gothic? And <laughs> I don't know. So, okay. So, I wrote this thing, and I actually claimed that part of it was about culture, but there was also something ecological about it. And I grew up in the low country, and Mm. so it's like just a swamp, basically. And in the summer, the air is like throbbing, and it's like deeply hot. And, you know, we would go swimming in all kinds of suspicious water holes. Mm -hmm. And so, I like, maybe I even have a brain parasite, (laughs) like, that's messed me up for life or something. Maybe 50% of the population in that area has the same brain parasite. (laughs) Maybe that's where the hyperbolic condition comes from. But, it, you know, there is something about, I think, the South in general and, and the strangeness and the weirdness that attracts folks that don't live here, didn't grow up here. That's much different than what you would expect from other aspects in North American literature. I mean, most of our literature does kind of come from a European tradition, but you see horror genre or something from the Northeast or... Even the desolate fiction in the Midwest or, or, you know, the far West that in the South, it seems like it's ordinary. The strange, the macabre, the the flat out weird is it's normal. A tow truck driver can have a supernatural experience, you know, whereas elsewhere, someone has to dabble into something in order to unlock a thing or they move the headstones but left the bodies. Whereas here, it's like the whole place is haunted. Um, Yeah, it is. And then, you know, of course, the deeply repressed, unpleasant aspects of the South and white Southern people don't like to talk about politics and those unpleasant repressed things. And so I think that contributes to the idea that the South is a haunted place Mm. because it's deeply repressed. And I feel like the Southern Gothic is also based on some eruption of the repressed, unpleasant due to like polite society or something. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's always about that. <laughs> you, well, yeah, I mean. And I, ghosts and, you know, filthy things bubbling up. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's there's always a pool of something filthy that you were probably swimming in um, as a kid. And uh, yeah. most folks who've grown up in this area can totally just relate to that. But it's a little interesting now because we've transitioned somewhat. We're parents. We now have kids that are growing up in the same place that we grew up in. I mean, maybe not the exact same location, but certainly shares a lot of the similarities of its geography. Do you sort of see similarities there? Well, yeah, my child is a total weirdo, but the stuff that she's in touch with culturally, it's like she's obsessed with anime Mm -hmm. and she draws a lot of weird stuff. And then, of course, she's got me as her mother. So I like oh, you like to draw here and take a look at Leonore Carrington's like surrealist <laughs> paintings. And I didn't have that. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of. I mean, my dad was like, here, read Dostoevsky. And he loved stuff like Edgar Allan Poe. But I mean, nothing that wasn't kind of mainstream literary, if that makes any sense. And that's another thing. My dad, the only like woman writer that he introduced me to really was Mary Shelley. And then he also told me a very creepy story about like the origins of Frankenstein. Like, oh, yes. She was 17 and had a baby and the baby died and she dreamed that it was alive and she went and touched it and it was cold and she was deeply upset. And then she wrote Frankenstein. (laughs) And I think I might have been like 10 when he told me that. (laughs) And then, you know, they let me watch The Exorcist when I was nine because Mm, my parents, like many Southern parents, like if there is a naked breast in a movie, my God, it will damage you for life. Mm -hmm. But it's perfectly fine to watch the censored television version of The Exorcist, which cuts out all the cursing, where a 12-year-old gets possessed by a demon. Right. That's fine. Yeah, totally. (laughs) So having the crap scared out of you, maybe that is part of it, too. You know, we do have a bizarre relationship with fear. I mean, a similar experience with me. 
It was not cool for me to listen to the music that I like to listen to, dropping in a Sex Pistols cassette, you know, blasting that from my bedroom. But it was perfectly fine for me to be over at my grandparents' house who had cable. We only had like three channels at our house, but they had cable and they went to bed early. I stayed up late and I watched, you know, Friday the 13th and I watched, you know, The Exorcist and Salem's Lot. Oh, yeah. Salem's Lot was <laughs> that didn't hold up, though. <laughs> no, it didn't. The Exorcist, holds. <laughs> the, the Exorcist scared me to death, yes. um, you know, and like there's still scenes that when I catch it, I will watch it specifically to see if I'll react the same way to that scene. And yeah. I teach it in my <laughs> horror class. I teach a class mostly on the monstrous feminine, so it's female monsters. Mm -hmm. So usually female monstrosity revolves around reproduction or sexuality, mm -hmm. of course. Um, monstrous pregnancy, monstrous birth, demon children. A lot of the uh, images of monstrosity that are in horror films today, you can trace a lot of them back to ancient monsters from Greek myth, but then also the medieval period is full of insane monsters. Mm -hmm. Just like the fairy queen has like a thousand weird female monsters. Yes. Like Duessa, this hag that has like a fox's tail and other kinds of strange monsters. And there, there were also one of the things I love. I was uh, fascinated by Renaissance gynecology. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and kind of late medieval <laughs> gynecology. And so like there were these weird text that would blend the so-called scientific with the tabloid images of monsters. So there were lots of weird stories about women giving birth to strange like reptilian monsters. And in one crazy story I read, a woman gave birth to a monster that was nothing but a foot that hopped around the room. <laughs> or like little creatures that run shrieking up the bedpost. Or a woman just spews all these little reptilian monsters and... <laughs> Good God. And so there was something about that that resonated with the Southern Gothic <laughs> and then contemporary horror films. So I guess like my idea of the weird comes from all the weird Renaissance and medieval stuff that's just absolutely freakish. And then the Southern Gothic, of course, and just all of that experience. And then a lot of horror films and weird literature. So really the weird, the strange, the gothic, all of that is something that's embedded in our very fabric and in the bedrock of just about everything we know. <laughs> I mean, essentially, I mean, goes yeah, all the way back. It doesn't take, I mean, it's really easy to get to the monstrous when you're examining anything. Julia Elliott's writing has appeared in Ten House, The Georgia Review, Conjunctions, The New York Times, Granta Online, and other publications. She has won a Rona Jaffe Writer's Award, and her stories have been anthologized in Pushcart Prize, Best of Small Presses, and The Best American Short Stories. Her debut collection, The Wilds, was a New York Times book review editor's choice, and her first novel, The New and Improved Romy Fudge, was published Tin House. So the beautiful thing about things that are strange, things that are weird, and how it attracts us, so much in the world today is built around the aspect of the weirdness about it being amplified. And so when we reach a piece of advertisement that is different from what we would expect to see, we're going to think about that product. I mean, advertisers have been using this for years. Art is no exception. Poetry, no exception. Stories, no exception. The stranger they are, the weirder they are, the more they seem to really represent life itself. Life is strange. Life is weird. And some of the most beautiful aspects about it are strange and weird. And to celebrate that and to celebrate that in art and literature and in life is really, I think, what makes it all beautiful. You've been listening to Binder, a production of Columbia Museum of Art. Today's episode was hosted by me, Ray McManus, Produced and edited by Drew Barron. Okay, I'm loud, so I should probably back this up. Uh, buh, 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 buh. <clears throat> rubber baby buggy bumpers. Rubber baby bumper bumper. <laughs> <laughs> With special assistance from Joel Ryan Cook. For more information about Binder, CMA exhibitions, and programs, 
please visit our website at www.columbiamuseum.org.